Amen. Welcome to the Log Church. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's give a hand to the VBS staff already. Thank you, God. You know, um, we didn't pay anybody for the community festival. We're going to double their salaries for VBS. <laughs> um, so I'm sitting in my car, and I'm outside of McGee Women's Hospital. My wife is coming in. We just saw somebody that had a baby. And I'm sitting there waiting to pick her up. And a woman gets in my car. And it wasn't my wife. My wife is a woman and this wasn't her. Okay? So this woman sits in my car and she says, hi. I said, hi. She said, how are you? I said, okay. And she said, um, thank you so much for being here. And I said, you're welcome. And as this exchange, this awkward exchange started, my wife comes in. And she gets behind the woman in the, in the back seat, in the driver's side back seat. She sits behind her. And I look at my wife, then I look at the woman, and my wife says hello to the woman, and the woman says hello to my wife. And then I'm looking at both of them and going, what part of the script did I not read? Because there's like a stranger in my car, and my wife seems to know this person. I don't know. So I'm sitting there with her. And the woman says, uh, I said to the woman, I said, can I help you with something? And she goes, no, just whenever you're ready to go, we can go. And I said, okay, where are you going? She goes, well, you know where we're going. I said, I know where I'm going. I don't know where you're going. And she said, yeah, I sent it to the app, the Lyft app. And I said, oh, I said, I'm, I'm not a Lyft driver. And she got really offended. She goes, yeah. She goes, this is a 2015 light blue Honda Civic, isn't it? I said, no, this is a 2005 dark red Ford Taurus. <laughs> Pretty sure there's not two cars that are more unsimilar than those two. And so Jamie said, oh, I thought you were from the church, she says to the woman. And the woman turns around and goes, no, I actually don't go to the church. And I'm like, why are you still in my car? Like this woman, <laughs> I don't understand. It's crazy. So, uh, do you ever ask yourself that question, why did I end up here? How did I end up here? And how often you ask yourself that question shows that you might be on a detour. This is part five of the series, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And this series is all about the things that God does or permits to happen in our lives that don't seem to make sense. And I'm going to tell you something today. God will sometimes permit a detour in our lives, won't he? He will sometimes permit. He has a plan. He has a path that he's put you on. But he sometimes will allow that path to look altogether different than what we expect. That's a bold statement, but it's true. And right now, some of you, you're on a detour. You're not where you should be. You know where God wants you to be. Like, you know, you know the vision. You have a picture of a future state that doesn't yet exist. You know that. But right now, you're not there. You're kind of like in a limbo. And I'm going to talk to you about what happens when you get on a detour today. I'm going to give you three reasons why we end up on a detour. And I'm also going to give you three ways that God gets us out of the detour. So we're going to share those together. Our story begins with a firecracker prophet. His name is Elijah. Elijah was the guy that when he prayed that it didn't rain, it didn't rain. Imagine that. You got, we live in Pittsburgh, okay? Do you know what we would do with that kind of power? You're like, I don't want it to rain today. Oh, it's not raining. Yes, okay? Elijah did that for three and a half years. For three and a half years, it didn't rain a drop. And then he prayed and it rained. Elijah was standing with the people of God along with God, on God's side, and the evil enemies of God, King Ahab and King Jezebel, they were ruling Israel at the time, and they were leading Israel into worshiping false gods, the God of Baal. And the God of Baal is not the true God, of course. Elijah's worshiping the one and only God. So they have this huge ceremony, and they're worshiping Baal, and they're going to do this sacrifice. And Ahab and Jezebel are there, and they say, look, our God is going to consume the sacrifice. 
And Elijah, being the mature person that he was, was standing on top of the mountain, and he was mocking them, saying, oh, yeah? He goes, I don't see your sacrifices being consumed. It's a little cold. No, see no, I don't see no fire. Is your God on a bathroom break? Is he taking a little nappy poo? I don't see him. And of course, it goes into a day and the, the God of Baal does not show up. Then Elijah prays and the sacrifice is consumed. And of course, there's this big victory and all 450 prophets of Baal are seized and executed. And Elijah sees yet another victory of God. He sees yet another glimpse of God's power. And then we see what happens. This is what's going to bring us into our story. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 2 and 3. It says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She says tomorrow. Everybody say tomorrow. Ready? Tomorrow. So Elijah is given this threat by Jezebel. Now, why doesn't Jezebel do this right now? Because she can't. Because she just saw that her God was rendered powerless, and she knows now that the living God that Elijah is worshiping has come through in a really big way, and she can't really do anything to him. So she sends this empty threat, this fake threat. And I mean, this, fat, this threat is empty. You know what I'm talking about. It's like the bully at school. You know, one of these days, you're going to be walking, and I'm going to catch you, and it's over. You have that, that fear but I mean, this threat is empty. I mean, this threat is emptier than the recycle bin on Hillary Clinton's email server. It is empty. It's empty. We still have months more of those kinds of jokes, folks. I made a Donald Trump joke last time I preached. I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender here, okay? So he gets this threat. Now remember, he just watched what God did. He's the guy that made it dry for three and a half years. He's the guy that made it rain after three and a half years. He's the one that's all these miraculous things. So I'm sure you would think he's going to stand up and say, yeah, why don't you come up here and make me thunder thighs? I'm not doing nothing. You're not doing nothing, Jezebel. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. My God is in control. But what does he do? This is what he does. It says, and he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life. He ran for his life. He didn't try to fight. Thus begins the detour of the prophet Elijah. Let me give you three things, three things that will cause you to have a detour. The first is withdrawing. The first is withdrawing. And I'm not talking about withdrawing from Jezebel, or withdrawing from battle. He withdrew from everyone that knew him. He takes a detour. And this isn't just any detour. He takes a 120-mile hike. 120 miles. That's from here to Cleveland. That would be like, Pastor Sam, this sermon is so boring. I have to leave, and I want to get as far away from you as possible. And you run up to Cleveland. He does this. It takes about six days. It might have taken him shorter if he would have run to this area called Beersheba. Now, we find him here with his servant. And look what he says to his servant. 1 Kings 19 verse 3, it says that he left his servant there. Now his servant, for the most part, has been serving with him in ministry for however long he's been in ministry. And people had servants in the Old Testament for two reasons, either because they were really rich or because they had uh, ministry work. So Elijah was not rich, but this man was along in ministry. So this guy is standing there and Elijah said, okay, at this point, your services are going to be no longer required of you. Now, if I was the servant person, I'd be like, dude, why didn't you tell me that like 60 miles ago, okay? Like there was a sheets back there. Now I have to go all the way back. He doesn't. He leaves him here. And on top of it, I would imagine, as you would think, the servant knew Elijah really well. He was his friend. They worked together in ministry. But Elijah removes himself from other people. Sometimes you put yourself on a detour because you hide what's going on from the people that mean the most to you. You hide what's going on from the people that mean the most to you. And what happens is you end up in this pit of shame and you don't know how to get out of it. But don't you realize that sometimes God wants to speak through 
the people that love you in Christ, that care about you in Christ. He wants to speak through those people. Look with me in Proverbs 11, verse 14. It says, in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. It doesn't say in an abundance of internal wisdom, there's safety. It doesn't say in an abundance of solitude, there's safety. He says in an abundance of counselors, there's safety. And Elijah has left the only counsel that he knows. And he's by himself now. When you withdraw from those that love you, when you withdraw from those who can hold you accountable when things are not going right, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be on a very long detour. Don't do that. Today, I want you to write down the name of someone that you can talk to, a trusted Christian friend, somebody that you care about, about what's been going on, because you may need them to help you get out of the detour. The second step we see that puts us at a detour, is self-pity. Self-pity. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. It says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and he sat down under a broom tree. A broom tree is a little tree, not made out of brooms, okay? It's a little tree that has little flowers on it. And it says, He asked that he might die. Oh God, please just kill me. Please. I just want to die. Take away my life, O Lord. He's not suicidal. He doesn't want to take his own life. He doesn't want to do anything to help himself either. He wants God to take his life. I would be silly if I wouldn't assume in church this size that we we ourselves have struggled with things like this from time to time. Not that you would hurt yourself, but that you just don't have the will to do anymore. You don't have the will to move on. Self-pity keeps us in a detour. Elijah said, okay, I've seen all this. No, it didn't work. Ahab and Jezebel still won't repent. Just kill me, please, God. How honest he is. I want you to know that when you're here, when this is happening, this is not where God wants you. You may be here for a moment, but I'm here to tell you it is not your final destination. You're on a detour. God has allowed you to go on a detour, and there's wisdom behind what he's doing, but you have to let self-pity take a backseat to God's plan because self-pity will keep you right where you're at. Third and final about things that put us in a detour, and that's impossible standards, impossible standards. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 He continues complaining to God. He continues pouring his heart out to God. And he says, I am no better than my father's. Question, church. Did God ask him to be better than his father's? Yes or no? No. Did God say, I want you to be like David? No. Abraham? No. Did God say, I want you to be like Moses? No. But instead... Elijah compares himself, and he compares his ministry to that what's going on. God didn't tell him to do this. We do this to ourselves all the time. You compared yourself to your father. You compare yourself to your brother. You say, I'm not like my sister. She's really successful, and I'm not. I'm not like my mom was. She handles this stuff better, and she worked, and I can't keep my house moving steady. We put ourselves under impossible standards. One of the things that I grappled with early on in my ministry for five years, I felt very uncomfortable speaking. I did. And I felt like, okay, I don't, I don't know if I could ever do this. And the reason why is because I believe that Pastor Mike is one of the most gifted communicators I've ever heard. And I mean that. I listen to him week after week, and I still hear from God every single week. And God speaks through him constantly. So I would sit there and watch him, and Pastor Mike would say, you know, you're going to have to speak coming up, and I'm going to have to start training you to speak. And then he would say other things like, you know, don't embarrass me, and like, <laughs> like things like don't ruin the church, you know, like encouraging, like encouraging things. Anyone that knows him knows this is true. So what I would do is I would write my sermons and preach just like he did. I mean, I had out, outlines, and I had my Bible the way he did, and I did everything the way he did. And it took me a while to realize, you know, God didn't call two pastor mics. I mean, 
I know as I'm watching him preach, I'm like, I'll never be that thin and good looking. So I just got to let that ship sail, okay? And he'll look at me and he'll think he's never going to be this funny, no matter what he does. So like we all have a piece to play. And my part is to be the best version of me that I can be doing what God has called me to be. And that's a liberating message. Church, some of you need to hear this right now. Some of you need to hear that God wants you to be the best version of you that you could possibly be. He didn't call you to be Pastor Mike. He didn't call you to be some other Christian leader that you know. He called you to be you. He called you to be you. Jesus died for you. He didn't die for some version of you that doesn't yet exist. Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you. Look at this. Here, let's read this together. I want you guys to read this. Ready? I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you hear the intimacy that God took to bring you into being? Don't try to be someone you're not. You have to be the version of you that God wants when you're with him. Some of you, this is a life-changing statement, and you need to live that way. You need to live like that. So I love this story because now it turns from what got him to the detour, and we're going to see how God got him out of the detour because believe it or not, God gets him out of this detour. Look with me in the next point. The first thing, I'm going to give you three things on how to move from a detour. The first thing is you have to recharge. You have to recharge. 1 Kings 19, verse 6. It says, and he looked. Now, remember, he's sitting under the broom broom tree. He's depressed. He's dejected. And there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. Now, before I get into the meat of this, I just want to make it clear. If you don't already know this about the pastors, if you don't already know this about me or Pastor Mike or Pastor Ron, I love the Bible. I believe that we need a steady dose of the Bible every single day. The Word of God breathes life into your soul. It does. I believe we need prayer. I believe we need to spend adequate time praying and making sure that we put all of our requests, all of our thoughts known unto God. But I also believe in the importance of church, how important it is to come. So all these things I I hold at my highest point of value and priority. However, I want you to pay really close attention to what God does to recharge Elijah. What was on that stone? Did God put a devotional note for him to read? Yes or no? No. Did God give him some Christian phrases to memorize? Yes or no? No. No. Did God give him the law of Moses and said, hey, Elijah, just so you know, um, you're not doing this stuff. You're not doing what others before you have done. I need you to memorize this. Did God leave him a book like that? No. What did God do? He gave him lunch. He fed him. Gave him a little bit of food. You say, well, why is that important? Well, here it is. God wants to recharge you. And God is bigger than what we make him out to be. Sometimes we think, okay, well, God only speaks to me and God only uh, blesses me through prayer, through worship, and through Bible study. But listen, that's not the truth. The truth is God brings you all good things, amen? All good things come from God. All good things come from God. So you being able to unwind and go to your favorite restaurant with your spouse or be able to sit and enjoy time with your family... That's the same God that gives you his word, that gives you prayer, that gives you all of these things. And God wants to recharge you. I want you to think about and write down something that you can do to recharge. Some of you, you're like a tension band. You are so wired and you're ready to snap. And God wants to get you released released from that tension. How's he going to do it? What do you like to do? I'm going to be honest. I'll tell you what I like to do. I don't have a lot of hobbies. I don't like, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of sports. I like hockey a little bit. I try to follow things, but I, I don't do well with it. You want to know what I do to recharge? This is your nerd alert. Ready? I go to the bookstore. I love the bookstore. Okay? So if you see me at the bookstore, I'm, rec- I'm recreating. That's what I'm doing. 
I'm enjoying time. I just go from shelf to shelf, look at different books. I look at all the new Christian books that are out. I read through them. I get my laptop. I pray. I write. I meditate. I could spend hours at the bookstore. My wife, when I ask her, I'm like, do you want to go to the mall? She's like, Ugh. she rolls her eyes because she knows what that means is I'm going to dump her at the mall and then I'm going to go to the bookstore, okay? That's what a good dating, after 10 years of marriage, that's, that's dating for you right there. Do separate dates, not with other people, obviously. Don't do that. But when I recharge, I, I walk out of the bookstore and I'm like walking out, like there's theme music playing. Like I'm so recharged. I like come out, the doors open at the same time because it, like that's how I feel. What makes you feel like that? What makes you feel like that? What causes you to get breath back in your lungs? What causes you to get enjoyment? Recharge. Let God recharge you. So God gives him food a couple times. And he now moves 40 more days and 40 more nights on a journey. He goes 250 miles. 250 miles, church. He goes from the 120 that he already clocked now to the 250. He's 370 mile, 370 miles from Jezebel. He is from here to New York City. That's how far he's walked. And he finds himself at a place called Mount Horeb. You know Mount Horeb by a better name. It's Mount Sinai. It's the place where Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. It's the place, if you remember, where Moses was standing up there and God spoke to him and God passed by him and permitted Moses to see God. It's that place. This is where Elijah finds himself. And so he finds himself at a cave, which brings me to my second thing of how God gets us out of a detour. We have to listen. I love these sermon points because they're like three syllables or less. <laughs> listen. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. It says, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of God came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Now, when the word of God comes to Elijah at this place, he doesn't come in this booming thunderous, what are you doing? Like you would expect that, right? He whispers, what are you doing here? Do you think God knows what Elijah's doing there? You think God didn't just stumble? Oh, Elijah, what are you doing? How did you get in here? Oh, man, I didn't know you were going to. That's not how God does this. When God asks a question of us, the question is for us. It's for our benefit. It's so that we can answer the question. Because let's be honest, most of the times we don't know. I don't know why we're most of the places we are. And I guarantee you, Elijah doesn't either. And the voice of God comes. And the Bible says then God causes a storm to come, but his, he's not in the storm. He causes an earthquake. And he's not in the earthquake. And there's a fire and there's wind and there's all these crazy things going on. And God is not in any of those things. Where is God? He's in the cave with Elijah in a still small voice. Not speaking through those big things, but speaking through those little, that little break of silence. You have to listen for that. Right now, you might be like Elijah in the cave and there's that storm. Right now, you might be looking at your circumstances and thinking, how am I going to get through this? But I'm here to tell you God's voice is not there. God's voice is next to you. His voice is in the cave with you. His voice is encouraging you. But he's also asking you, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? What is he doing here? Elijah spouts off all the things. I'm the, I'm, I'm the only one that worships you. There's no hope. I'm the only one that hasn't bowed my knee and it's hopeless. Jezebel and Ahab, this is what he's thinking. They haven't repented. Israel is still under control of these evil leaders. I thought your plan was gonna go this way. I thought you wanted me to deliver the nation. I thought you wanted me to wipe these evil people out. I thought you wanted that for me, but apparently you don't. That's what Elijah says essentially. He is very direct with God. Look with me at the final thing that I want for you. This is the, the entire point of this sermon. This is what you need to hear about this detour that you're on because it's not going to change unless you change it. Number three, you have to move. 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 
1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. It says, the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. God says, okay, I ain't baking no more cakes for you. I ain't giving you no more water. We, the conversation is getting stale in here, Elijah. Get on the road and move. He says, get on the road and move. Now, what does he say in response? He goes, you're not the only one. Here's the problem. While you came here, you rode here in the ambulance. Some of you, we ride the we ambulance. And all we're thinking of is ourselves. We're thinking of our problems. We're thinking of our stresses. And God tells Elijah, he says, listen, Elijah, I have a prophet for you to ordain. I have work for you to do. He says, there's 7,000 people that have yet to bow down to these false gods. I need you to go and be the spokesperson. I got a job for you. This is only beginning. This is only beginning. And he tells Elijah, very candidly, get up and move. That's the message I have for you today. Some of you, you need to move out of the detour. You've been here long enough. You have viewed your detour as your final destination, and it isn't. You have to move in God's grace from death to life, from sorrow to joy, from crying to dancing, from anxiety to confidence. From fear to expectation. You need to move. You need to move. The message is this. It's time for you to get out from under that tree. It's time for you to get out from under that tree. You are not finished. Your journey is not over. You still have breath in your lungs. You still have a job to do. You still have a God to honor. You still have a worship experience to have with him. You still have things in your life that need to be given over to him. But you have to move. The detour has come to an end. For some of you, you've been detoured. You've been sidelined. I'm here to tell you on the authority of God's word. Some of you, for the best parts of your life have yet to come. God's still working. God's still doing new things. God is still doing miraculous stuff. Allow him to speak that still small voice into your detour. Allow him to change you and to transform you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the love that you show us in your word every head bowed and every eye closed. Right now, if there's somebody here who does not know where they would spend eternity, if you are in that category and you do not know where you would go when you died, I want you to pray this prayer. It's not about the prayer that saves you. It's what God's doing in your heart. If you've never trusted in Jesus, I want you to do this today. Just pray, my heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I know that Jesus came down from the cross or came down from heaven. He died upon the cross. He was buried, and he rose again. I accept his forgiveness. I believe he died for me. So I turn from my sin, and I turn to you. Change me, mold me, make me yours. Now, Father, I pray for those of us that are on a detour. Oh, God. Help us to move. Recharge us. Let us listen to your voice. Do not let this detour become our destination. We know that you've called us to higher than that. Now I thank you for this and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.